So welcome everybody to the um, uh, Departmental uh, Distinguished uh, lecture, uh, lecture and I would like to um, uh, thank everybody for attending and especially Professor Mark Billinghurst for uh, agreeing to uh, take part in the, this uh, Distinguished Lecture series uh, from literally the other side of the world uh, is uh, uh, coming and uh, talking to us from uh, New Zealand, uh, pretty much down under, a, a wonderful place. And without further ado, let me introduce Professor Mark Billinghurst. He is the director of the Empathic Computing Laboratory at the University of South Australia and also uh, at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. He is a pioneer in the fields of augmented and virtual reality and he has been researching augmented reality and virtual reality for over 25 years. He has published a lot of papers, over 550 research papers on topics such as collaborative augmented reality and virtual reality, multimodal uh, user interfaces, mobile augmented reality and em empathic computing. In 2013, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand and in 2019, he was given the ISMAR Career Impact Award in recognition for his lifetime contributions to the research and commercialization of augmented reality. And is uh, one of uh, the founders, uh, the founding fathers of the International Symposium of Mixed and Augmented Reality. And we are privileged to entertain his talk on Towards Empathic Computing, Next Generation Collaborative Technologies. Uh, Thank you so much for making yourself available and for your time, Mark. No problem. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Excellent. That's great. It's good to see you all. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I wish I could be with you in Portugal. I would enjoy the fantastic food and the amazing uh, culture you have there. So, shall I share my screen? Are you ready for me to present? Oh, yes. Uh, so Sorry, share screen options, advanced sharing options. Uh, there you go, you should be able to. Great, thank you so much. So let me just um, share my screen. And... Excellent. Great. Um, so are you seeing the presentation view now or the, um, like the, uh, oh, we are good to go. We are seeing, oh, there you go. Great. Excellent. Okay. Well, it's fantastic, um, to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I know that we're living in very strange times right now, and I'm not sure about what it's like in Portugal. But for me, um, over the last few months, a lot of times my workplace has looked uh, like this one. So this is some of the lab meetings we've had. Currently in New Zealand, we uh, can now teach face-to-face, -face, but for many months this year, we were doing um, online teaching. And it seems like the more time we spend online, the more uh, tired uh, we are getting. Um, in fact, there's a term for that. So that, now they call this uh, Zoom fatigue and you can go online and there are many, many articles about why um, you are getting tired um, sitting all day in, in front of the computer. People talk about how there's really three reasons why video conferencing is so tiring. You know, you have some physical factors, you know, you're sitting all day in, in the poor post posture, you have longer work hours. Right now it's 1.30 in the morning for me, so I've already worked you know, 12 hours today and I'm still working. Um, there's also some cognitive factors. Um, you have to concentrate more to try and perceive non-verbal cues or eye gaze cues. Um, you need to focus more intently and sometimes you have split attention. You, know, you may be video conferencing, but at the same time you may have another monitor available with Facebook or, or some other thing on there. One of my students last time I was teaching was playing a computer game the same time I was trying to teach. So she was definitely having multitasking. And of course, there are social factors. Um, when you're online, um, uh, you're always aware that other people are watching you. You've got the camera on your face. You can see yourself, and there's this kind of constant staring. So all these factors together 
mean that um, spending time online and, and conferencing is very different from face-to-face. -face. People sometimes try to make it a bit more entertaining. And this is my friend, uh, Dan Novi. Dan is from MIT. And when he goes to Zoom meetings, he uses um, some augmented reality plugins to be able to uh, turn them into different characters or into different environments. And so he said that was really great, except now people invite him to meetings just to see what he's going to come like. So it ends up him having more meetings. Um, so of course we have many, many teleconferencing tools um, today, um, ranging from um, uh, tools for our desktop or our mobile or big teleconferencing suites, or even these telepresence robots like the iBeam where you can walk around. But one of the problems is that these tools um, aren't like face-to-face -face collaboration. And here's a typical face-to-face -face collaboration scene. And one of the things you'll notice in this picture is that uh, you, these are some architects around the table talking about um, a building they're planning to make. So really on the table in the middle of them is the task space. And then you have this communication space, which is um, encompasses all the people. And in the communication space, they can easily share uh, verbal and nonverbal cues. Um, they can even interact with real objects and, and the environment around them. But when we start introducing technology into the mix, we have the separation between the, the task space and the communication space. So here you see some people at work. And of course, um, the screen now is the task space. So we'll focus on the screen. And the communication space is now separate. In fact, it's, it's very hard if you're in this situation to uh, be aware of nonverbal uh, communication cues when you're focusing on the screen. And it's the same with typical teleconferencing setup. So now you have a group teleconferencing. This one has two screens. One screen is you know, people's faces. And the second screen is a, a showing a mole molecule. And again, you've got this task space and this communication space in this artificial seam uh, between them. So with current teleconferencing technology, there are a number of limitations. There's you know, lack of spatial cues, which is why we get the Zoom fatigue. Um, they support some poor uh, communication cues. So limited gaze and gesture, nonverbal communication, and also this artificial separation between the physical and digital space, or the separation between the task space and the communication space. So new technology can try and address this problem. And one of my students, for example, he's been looking at how you can bring 3D um, environments into video conferencing. So um, on the uh, left-hand side there, there's an application from a company called spaces.com. And you can use uh, virtual reality as a camera feed into a Zoom or WebEx or Skype session. And on the bottom right is the work we'd be doing in our lab for the same thing. In fact, here's a video of this working. And you'll see here on the, this is a Zoom session. On the top left is my stu student who's in VR and he can now stream the camera feed into Zoom and he can do things like manipulate 3D objects or move through a space and bring people with them. So to some extent, it brings back the 3D um, into, into a Zoom that you lose by having um, the 2D desktop conferencing. And you can do things like, for example, drawing on a whiteboard and having more natural nonverbal cues. So in, in my research, we, I've been working for a long time on looking at how you can use AR and VR to create new types of collaboration. In fact, my work goes back into the, to the late 90s. And um, here's two examples. So in, in 1994, um, when I first started my PhD, I was involved in a very small way in, a, in, a, in the Green Space Project, which is a project to create a, a shared virtual environment that spanned the Pacific. So on the right-hand side there, you can see uh, several people and two of them are in Seattle and two of them were in Japan and when they put the VR headset on they would see themselves in this Japanese tea room and they would have some spatial cues that would um, create the illusion that they're in this shared space together. And then on the left hand side is some early work that we did on augmented reality conferencing so uh, 20 years ago we could uh, look into the real world and see live video textures of remote people appearing in our real space. And in both of these situations, they in, had increased uh, spatial cues and also improved social presence. Of course, the technology has progressed a lot since those times. Um, so for example, here is um, a video conference or a, a, an AR chat that I had with um, Tom Furness, my PhD advisor 
a month or so ago. And this is using the Outspace VR, and probably many of you have used Outspace, but it's a very nice online um, uh, th a 3D chat environment where you can go and, and feel like you're in the online space together. Uh, just over the last several months, Facebook with the Facebook Horizon have been building a large uh, social VR spaces. And it's, it's, in, it's in beta testing now. So if you're lucky, you may have a beta um, key to get in to try it out. But this allows you to have many um, thousands of people sharing the same multi-user social VR space at the same time. It's a very large scale 3D virtual space and has things features like in-world content creation authoring. But here's a video showing what Beyond our world, there's another world. And it's right here on my face. Welcome, this is Horizon. Think of me as your guide slash self-appointed spokes avatar here to show you around. You know, Horizon is filled with possibilities. You can play stuff, make stuff, fly stuff. Whoa, really love the stash, Stuart. What up, Stuart? Wait, I want a mustache. Horizon isn't about rules or limits or pants or people telling you not to fly an airplane while drinking your fresh ground, fair trade, French press morning coffee through a curly straw. Isn't that right, Debbie? Mm-hmm. It's about getting out there and trying I'll new stop things. That. So that kind of gives you an idea of what Horizon's like. Um, with these types of social VR spaces, of course, you still have a separation between the real world and the, and the virtual world, but they provide a very compelling experience and overcome some of the social, the spatial, um, uh, lack of spatial cues you have in, normal video conferencing. But perhaps an even better example is from the company Spatial. And this is the Spatial example. In this case, they can use AR and VR to bring very realistic characters into um, uh, shared uh, mixed reality experiences. So let me play this one. Oops, sorry. If there was a better way to collaborate, a better way to build and work together. So with spatial, you can quickly take a photograph of yourself. A way that brought us closer, as if we were sitting AI next to each other, on, face to face. You can see people in life size in your real uh, world. What if our creativity could burst to life in the space around us? Spatial is a collective computing environment that lets teams visualize their thoughts in the room around them. So whether you're on a desktop computer or scribbling notes on your phone. All your digital devices are seamlessly tied together into an infinite workspace. You can manifest your ideas before your eyes by just saying them, and in a click, expand them with the power of all the world's information. Using augmented reality's infinite canvas, pixels become tactile, letting you manipulate them like clay. We believe digital and physical worlds should live in harmony together. You can so sketch ideas out on paper now. Um, it's available for free. Have them exist digitally. And it runs across a multiple platforms. Um, like you can see Spatial on the brings here, people and ideas they together into a um, single shared environment. Uh, they can Let use um, a desktop client, a web client. It runs on AR displays. If you have the um, Oculus Quest, they have a, a client for the Oculus Quest. And it allows people to collaborate across multiple platforms and share the same um, experience together. But the real benefit really comes in when you start using it in this AR case like this, where you can have remote people that feel like they're standing around the same real table. And then as you can see in this case, they can bring in 3D objects or 2D images and start collaborating on, um, on spatial tasks. So one of the benefits of this is that, of course, now you can use augmented reality to, to break these artificial communication cues. And as, as the spatial example shows you, you can now have very natural conversation and you can share gesture and gaze cues and the task space becomes a subset um, of the um, communication space uh, again. So one of the goals of, of video conferencing um, for a long time was to create an experience as close as possible as to being there so everybody can be feel like they're uh, together face to face. But there's a really great paper written um, about 25 years ago from um, Jim Holland and Scott Stornetta called Beyond Being There. And if you haven't read this paper, I really encourage you to read it. And it, it talks about how we shouldn't use technology to try and replicate what we have in face to face communication but we should try and go beyond that. And he says a better way to solve the telecommunication problem is to not focus on the tally part, but to focus on the communication part. 
and to develop tools that people want to use even if they are face-to-face. -face. So for example, um, meeting support tools that automatically record meetings and play them back. And so tools that people want to be able to use um, even if they are um, together. And so we can use AR and VR to go beyond being there and support new types of collaboration. Um, so for example, we can use things, AR and VR to do things like uh, uh, copying spaces. And so people can feel like they're both in the same space, changing your body scale, copying people's bodies, changing, um, sharing nonverbal cues, changing perspective and sharing views. And I'm going to show some of those in some of the slides um, in a minute. And I'll talk about some of the research we've done in each of these areas. So first of all, about changing perspectives. So a long time ago, in the early 90s, um, British Telecom developed a project called CamNet. In this project, they had a person with a wearable computer that was also wearing a camera on their head. And so, and you can see on the right, the person there. And the idea was this person would be able to go to a work site and live stream video from their head to a remote person and, um, and then get feedback from the remote person, which they could see in their display. So this was done a long time ago. Um, and, and studies like the, um, the since that time, uh, Carnegie B. Mellon started studying this in, in the mid nineties, found that by having a remote person being able to share your real space, you could cut your performance time or your work time in half. Of course, that's very common now. So this is an example of a similar system we've developed in, in my lab. So here is a person with a pair of smart glasses. And in this case, they've got a depth sensing camera on their head. And again, we can live stream the video from their head to a remote person. And the remote person can annotate on the video and we can send the annotations back. So you can see that in this video, um, on the right hand side is the remote person annotating on the video and the left hand side is the view through the head mount display and the annotation appears fixed in space. And because we're using a depth sensing camera, we can track when the person moves their head and we can make sure that the 3D annotation appears fixed on the uh, real object. So this is not very novel, but, um, and, and you can see there are some limitations. In particular, uh, one of the limitations is that um, with this type of system, you want to have a very wide field of view camera. So the remote person can see a lot of your workspace. But um, when you've got a very wide field of view camera, you can't really tell um, what you're looking at because you, know, you could be looking at anything in that view. So um, a, a couple of years ago, we developed a system called the Empathy Glasses. And the system combined together three technologies. We had a, um, smart glasses, we had eye tracking, and we had a special pair of um, frames called effective wear frames that could measure the person's face expression. So the idea of these classes was to try and share some of the nonverbal cues we have in face-to-face -face communication, like um, eye gaze and face expression. And those cues you don't typically get when you have that remote collaboration like I showed you before. So here's the kind of system set up here. So um, you can see the person wearing all the technology on their, on their head. On the right hand side, you can see what they're seeing inside the head mount display. Um, the most important thing is the, um, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but the, the green dot there and the red dot. So the green dot is the feedback from the remote expert. So the remote expert can point on the video and the person in the head mount display will see the um, pointer working. And then the uh, red dot is actually the eye gaze of the person wearing uh, the system. So um, what this means now is that um, you can now share implicit communication cues. So for example, if the person who is um, providing some help to you uh, is asking you to do some task, they can tell if you're paying attention or not because they can see um, if your eye gaze is moving to where they're telling you to go. So this means now that you don't need to be always um, giving a person instruction and watching them to, to do some performance, you can um, watch what they're about to do because by following their eye gaze. So this um, video shows the system working. And so you can see here, um, you've got a person wearing our system and what they're doing is basically putting together um, a picture made of blocks. And then that's live streamed to a remote um, person and the remote person can then move their mouse to be able to tell, give the person instruction. And as you can see, as they're moving the mouse around, the red dot follows the green dot most of the time. And this shows that the person wearing the head mount display is uh, paying um, attention to you. And we also have the ability to monitor the heart rate and also monitor face expression. So we can uh, tell when the person is feeling confused or smiling. 
and this is how we monitor the face expression by using photoreflective sensors and, and measuring the distance to the skin on the face. And as you made different face expressions, that, that would, would change. So what we found with user studies with this is that by sharing the, um, the remote pointing and especially the remote gaze, people uh, found, felt more socially connected and they had an enhanced sense of social presence and were able to work better together than if they were just um, uh, watching what the other person was doing. However, what you can see in, in this case, which is another problem, is we're still only sharing a 2D video. So that means the remote person always has to look in the same direction as the person who's wearing the camera because the camera is facing in that person's um, direction. So about 18 months ago, we developed a new project called the Shared Sphere Project. In this project, we used a 360 video. So you can see on the left-hand side here, a person wearing a 360 a camera. And then we can live stream the 60, 360 view to a person inside a virtual reality. And the person in virtual reality also has uh, gesture tracking uh, hardware on their head. So we can capture their hand gestures and send them back to the person inside um, the augmented reality. So the augmented reality user sees kind of ghost hands floating in front of him. But the main difference now is that because we're using 360 video, the remote person can look in any direction they want. They don't need to just look in the same direction that you're looking. And so on the bottom two images there, you'll see these red and green squares. And this is to show the viewpoint of the other person. So you know where they're looking. So here's a video of how that might be used. This is with the power company. And what we have here is the person looking at a very complicated power control panel. And um, you can, um, uh, he's wearing a HoloLens and 360 camera. And in his head mount display, he can see these kind of ghost hands. And the ghost hands can be used to point at objects in the real world or put annotations on them and draw on them. And so the remote person can give you, um, can give you guidance. And you can see that that green square that shows where the remote person is looking. And then in the VR view, we live stream the 360 view to the remote person. And now the person uh, feels like they're surrounded by video. So to them, it almost feels like they're standing in the same body as a local worker. Wherever they look, they can see the real world. And then again, they can make annotations on that um, real uh, world. So obviously this is a, a, a quite a lot of hardware. We've got, you know, the whole lens and um, 360 camera and re whatever remote PC and a VR system. So it's thousands of dollars of, of, um, of uh, technology. So earlier this year, when, when COVID first um, hit, we decided we wanted to try and build a, a low cost version of this, especially for helping with um, virtual uh, tourism. Because of course, in New Zealand now, we, we cannot longer have international tourists. So we um, want some way that remote tourists can come to New Zealand. So we developed a system where you could have a, a 360 camera and a tablet and the person could walk through the um, real world and then could live stream the 360 video to somebody on desktop and they can view that on the web. So it doesn't involve any plugin or, or download software. And then we built um, a 360 plugin to um, an open source video conferencing platform um, called um, Jitsi. And Jitsi is, is basically similar to Zoom. Um, but you can, um, but you can, because open source, you can add your own extensions to it. So we bought the 360 live streaming, and also with our system, you can um, yeah, upload pre-recorded mm -hmm. content and also um, uh, so video and, and also still images yeah. as part of it. So cool. here's a video of the system oh, yeah, working. So you can see a person going going into the um, museum in uh, New Zealand. And she's walking around with, with the 360 camera and her phone. And then what she can do is she can live stream that to um, dozens of remote people. So here's some people um, on the video link. And the person clicks on there. And now um, you can see the 360 view. And so as she's walking through the, um, the museum, she can live stream. And now what he's doing is he's going to preload some pre-recorded video. So this is a video of taking from somewhere else in the museum. Again, because it's 360, he can look around as he likes. Um, so there's different um, pre-recorded um, uh, video clips. And then we can also um, load photographs. And the photographs are really great because they, they appear as high resolution. One of the, and so you can see he's loading up this, this photograph of the local Amari exhibit. And it's much higher resolution than the video. So through using the combination of 360 photographs and 360 video and live 360, you can have a, a live touring experience and create a good 
a connection between the real guide and remote uh, virtual people. And of course, this could have many applications. You know, I showed you the earlier example of a person doing some repair task in a power company. Well, this could also be used for repair tasks or remote technical assistance or um, for education or tourism or other applications. What we're most recently doing though is looking at how we can capture uh, 3D models. So one of the downsides of using 360 video is of course you can't move through the video because you just got a video textured onto a sphere. So in the last year or so, I've been looking at how we can build uh, cluster uh, 3D point clouds from uh, depth sensors and how we can fuse the point cloud together to build a live 3D environment. So you can see here a cluster of um, depth sensors and um, we can uh, take the point cloud from each of the depth sensors and fuse it together to build a 3D model. And so this video here shows that working. On the left-hand side is the top-down view, the God's Eye perspective. And the right-hand side is a live first-person view of our workspace. So you can see the person viewing this inside VR. And the second, you can see my student working to this, walking into the space so on the left-hand side there. And as he moves around, you can see him moving uh, through the space. So we have live 3D um, model capture. Of course, you can see there's some problems. One problem is that you can only build a 3D model where the cameras can see. So the, the blue spots in this image here are the uh, regions where they can't see. Also, the, the white table on the front is supposed to be, um, is supposed to be um, a flat table, but you can see it's kind of a wavy surface going through this because the cameras aren't quite calibrated um, correctly. So with the system, again, we could use, use this for remote collaboration. You, you can imagine putting this um, in a, um, factory and then we could live capture from the factory and we could stream that to a remote person who could experience that inside VR and then give you feedback and um, help you perform a task inside the factory. Um, and here's another version of that same system working. On the left hand side you, you can see a, a table with um, in the AR view you can see his hand gesture appearing and, and then as the person moves the object um, from the real world you can see the person in the VR is trying to tell him where to place the object and the person puts the object down on the table. So this is the same system, except this time we put the camera surrounding the table and looking from outside in rather than from inside out. Um, and then of course the person in VR can interact with the, with, um, the 3D model or live 3D model of the real world and then their uh, gestures can be sent into the, um, into the real world where you can see them helping you perform a task. So over the last uh, few years, we've gone from uh, 2D uh, video streaming to 360 and now to a 3D. And so it basically involved um, providing increased immersion, um, improved scene understanding and much, much better uh, collaboration. Once, once you've got um, a capture of the real world in 3D, you can start having a collaboration between AR and, and VR environments. And you can also add other communication cues that might help you collaborate better. So on this project, called the COVA project, we looked at how we could have one person in AR in the real world, and then a second person in VR and a copy of the real world, and we could have them working together. But we also looked at how we could add extra communication cues. So you can see on the top panels here, the panel number C is showing that um, from the virtual heads of each of the people, we have this pyramid, the view frustum going out. So we can know where the person's looking even when we can't see their face. So this video shows us working on the left hand side is the real environment, the right hand side the digital copy. And when we go into AR, we can see this pink head and the, and the pyramid from their face. And again, in VR, the same thing. So now we can see the view frustration of the person and we also have some hand gestures as well. So we have this kind of um, head and hands to give us some non-verbal cues. And we did a little comparison to see whether or not seeing that view frustration would improve collaboration. So you can see now, I can see the pink triangle, even though I can't see the person's face. So I know that what they're looking at, even when um, I can't see their face anymore. And so in this case, we did a task where people had to look at objects together and try and manipulate them together. And, and seeing that view frustration significantly improved performance. So once you have a copy of the real world, you can do a number of different things. Like you can change your, your body scale. So you can make yourself really large or really small, or you could put yourself into other people's body. So here's an example of changing body scale. So we have on the left-hand side, the person inside VR, the right-hand side, the AR view, and the person in VR is dropping some uh, cubes and cylinders down. And now he makes himself really big. And so the AR person you see has a small pink head now. And so he's four times the size. And so now he can do things at a very large um, scale. 
Um, so this might be good for we we have application where you want to have a God's eye perspective on the overall scene. And then in a minute, you'll see him scale himself down to a uh, one-to-one -one scale again, and then even much smaller than that. Um, so now he's back one-to-one -one scale, and um, so you can see his collaborator the same size, and then he's going to make himself one-tenth the scale. Now he's really small, and you can look up and see this giant head looking down at him. And of course, with, with AR and VR copies, you can now um, inhabit the body of somebody else and see from exactly their perspective. One of the other interesting things we explored is, is around sharing nonverbal communication cues. And so in, in many collaborative virtual environments, you may have a situation where you can't see the face or the body of the person anymore. So you can see in this picture here, you've got two people collaborating in a virtual environment, but on the right hand side, one person is looking at a box on the shelf and the other person is behind her and she can't really see the person's face anymore because um, he's behind her. And so uh, she, she loses a lot of nonverbal cues. So we developed a system called Mini-Me and the idea of Mini-Me was that when you can't see the uh, life-size uh, av virtual, virtual avatar of the um, remote real person, then we would create a miniature version of that person and put it in your field of view so you could always see that and that conveys some of the same nonverbal communication cues. And this is particularly helpful for AR VR collaboration with many of the AR systems that people use today. They have a very small uh, field of view. And so it's very hard to look at the person's virtual body at the same time as looking at what they're um, looking at in the real world because you can't see both at the same time. So this is the mini me system here. So when the person in the AI headset is looking at the real box, she sees this little miniature character appearing that um, points at the same point of the box as the life-size real person. So I'll show you a video of that. So the video first of all shows one of the problems with augmented reality is a limited field of view. So when I look at um, this life-size person, um, I can't see him and also see where he's looking at the same time. So we take this little miniature person and put them in our field of view. So you can see at the bottom there the miniature person is appearing. And the miniature person points at the same location in the real world as the life-size person. So when the person's behind me pointing at this box, I see this little miniature person appearing, pointing at the same box. So even though I can't see my um, collaborator, I can see the copy of them um, exhibiting some of the same nonverbal uh, cues. And so the mini-me automatically emerges when you lose sight of the person. So when I turn away and the person goes out of view, then this little miniature character appears pointing at the same location in the real world as the life-size person was pointing and then disappears again when I can see them. We also most recently did a project um, called On the Shot of the Giants, which is a little bit extension of Mini-Me. And the idea, let me just uh, pause this for a second. So the idea was that um, if you're collaborating with a remote person, you may want to be able to um, control what the person can see by dragging their body around. So you can see here in this picture, a person wearing a, a HTC Vive head mount display, and they're actually seeing a um, mixed reality view of the real world. And then in her hand, she's holding a small uh, tripod. And on the tripod, there's a virtual person you can see here. Oops, let me go back. And um, let me just go forward to that again. All right. And the virtual person represents where the remote person is. And so she can. Um, move their viewpoint around by just moving the tripod around and then that drags the person's view around and then this is the um, and the and the person is seeing from the 360 view from that perspective so this is the 360 view from the remote user on the side here also on this little virtual avatar body you see again a view for us from with if you've got very good eyes you can see a texture map video on the front here that shows what the person is um, is uh, seeing so if I play the video you can see that play through and so she's um, getting him to uh, help um, uh, fix um, uh, a PC. So you can see the real PC there. So what she wants to do is move his virtual body around so he can see the PC from um, uh, a good position. So she puts his body now on, on the edge of the PC and he, she's, he's helping her replace a graphics card and he can now look inside the PC and give her guidance and he can point with um, his uh, uh, controllers, Vive controllers, and she can see the controllers appearing in the real world uh, where he's pointing so now they can work together.
And so we did a little study to see um, what type of um, um, visual cues we wanted to provide. You know, do, we need, do we need to provide an avatar body or um, the avatar with a view frustrum or the view frustrum by itself um, or no visualization at all? And we found that having the avatar plus the view frustrum um, provided um, much better collaboration. So um, with some of my older work, we've also looked at how you can build um, transitional collaborative AR VR interfaces. So many times people are doing um, uh, are doing uh, collaboration, you know, either in AR or in in VR. So I showed you, for example, the uh, Facebook Horizons where everybody's in VR together, or the um, spatial example where you've got people in AR together. But um, in some cases, you want to be able to not just um, have collaboration at a, at a single point on this mixed reality continuum, but all along it. So for example, you might want to have a real object that you collaborate around, in this case, a book, or you can have an augmented reality copy of that object. So when you look at the real book, you see virtual content popping out of the pages, or you could um, go inside the um, augmented reality scene and experience it as an immersive virtual world. So a long time ago, um, as part of my PhD, we developed this Magibus project, which did just that. So you can see in this video here, uh, with the magic book, you have a real book and uh, people can read it like normal. So the great thing about real books, of course, is you can share them with each other. So here's, here are two of us um, reading this um, book. And um, of course we can see the pages together and share it like a real object. But then um, if we want to, we can pick up uh, augmented reality um, headsets and look at the page of the book and seeing the AR content uh, come uh, to life. And so you'll see now we have these handheld AR displays and when we pick up the display, um, we can now look at the page of the book and we can both see uh, augmented reality scene from our own uh, perspective. Um, so you'll see that in just uh, a second. So when we open the page of the book, you'll see a little AR content popping out. And in this case, it's a Japanese princess and she's crying. And the reason why she's crying is because she's lost some of her treasure. So the book is really a story about how she can find her treasure. And every second page of the book is a place. And when you see the place, if you want to, you can um, fly inside that and be immersed inside the VR um, scene. So um, you'll see now we open the page up and we see um, this um, farm, her friends, uh, Shogun's farm. And then we can push a button on a display and we can fly, fly inside that and experience that as an immersive VR environment. So of course, the graphics are very crude because this is, this is um, almost 20 years old, but you get the idea of how you can transition between AR and VR. And now, and now because I'm in the VR space, my friend is still looking at the book in the AR space. And so he can see me as a little character now in the page of the um, VR or the AR scene. So you'll see in this page now, um, that little pink dot there, a blob, that's my head. And as I move through the VR um, uh, world, you can see me um, in the AR scene. And of course, if we were to keep the um, metaphor consistent, um, when I look up into the uh, virtual sky of the, um, of the virtual environment, I should see my friend in the real world looking down at me. And indeed, that's what happens. So you'll see that in the next, the next scene. So now um, this is back to me in the um, VR environment. And when I look up, there's my friend in the real world looking down at me. And as he moves around the real world, he moves me. And of course, um, what we can do is both of us can come together in the VR space and experience it together. So as I said before, this is very old, but even now um, it's very unusual to find examples of um, uh, VR systems that let, or AR systems that you transition between AR and VR. Most collaborative experiences are designed either for AR or for VR, but actually because you know many applications you want to get um, a God's eye perspective as well as a life size perspective, um, you may want to have both. You know, AR is really good for sharing face-to-face non-verbal cues, but VR is really good for immersing yourself into the um, into the data set. So, in the in the uh, magic book, we had collaboration on multiple levels. You know, collaboration is a physical object, there's an AR object, there's an immersive space, and we could also sort e support ego 
asymmetric collaboration. And of course, we also had different independent views because we had our, all our own view headsets. So you could have, you know, if you had a teacher and a student, then maybe the teacher sees one thing in their display and the student something else and you had your own privacy. So that kind of gives you an overview of what we're doing in, in our lab. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of future trends. And um, in my opinion, there's um, several important future trends happening in the collaborative technology space. So one is the trend towards experience capture. So we're transitioning now from just um, you know, sharing faces on a Zoom call to people wearing cameras and, and sharing uh, first person videos and sharing uh, places. So you can see an example here. A second big trend is much faster networks. You know, when I first started computing, and I'm sure there's some of you there the same age as me, you know, we had 56K or even 2400 board modems, and, you know, we were doing text chat, and that was about all we could support. But now, you know, my apartment here in Auckland has a gigabit fiber connection to the apartment, and so I can stream 4K video, and, and faster networks supports much, much more natural uh, collaboration. And the final trend, is towards implicit understanding. So what that means is now we can build systems that recognize our behaviors and our, our emotions. So we've got computer vision systems that can look at us and recognize um, when they're doing certain actions like walking or running, or they can look at our faces and they can uh, recognize our emotion from or our age from our faces. Or, you know, we can push a button and we can talk to Siri and Siri on a, a mobile phone can to some extent recognize our emotion from our audio. So we've got a lot of different tools now that can uh, look at us and, and recognize implicitly what we're trying to do. So these are three big important areas that are happening in computer science and interface um, research. We to work towards natural collaboration, towards experience capture, and also towards implicit understanding. And where my lab right now is working is at the junction of the space, which is the area that we call empathic uh, computing. So the idea of empathic computing is, you know, can we develop systems that allow us to share what we are seeing hearing and especially feeling with other people. And I've already shown you a couple of examples of that. You know, the, the, um, the empathy glasses was an example of a system that would, was sharing what I was seeing and hearing, but also because it recognized my face expression to some extent what I was feeling with others. But we've gone beyond that. So for example, we've been looking at how we can use virtual reality to prototype what it's like to share emotion um, well, in the real world, but in this case, we're sharing it in VR. So in this system, we had a person in VR and they wore this special biometric glove and the glove would basically measure their, um, their heart rate and their GSR, so the sweat level on their skin and use that to make inferences about their emotion and then share that with a remote person also in VR. So we had one person who was playing a game, a second person who was the observer and you know, we, we theorized that if we shared the heart rate between one person to the other person, then the person who's the observer may also get excited as well. So we built a system with um, uh, different types of VR experiences. Um, there's one that was butterfly catching. So in this case, you had um, a, a, a net, you had to catch butterflies. They were very peaceful. And the second VR environment was zombie killing, kind of scary game. So here's a video of that working. In this research, Oops, we sorry. Let me go back and play that again. There we go. In this research, we explore the effects of sharing physiological states of players in collaborative virtual reality gameplay. Our goal is to improve and enhance users' empathy among collaborators, especially in a remote setting using advanced computer interfaces. To support this study, we developed a collaborative VR framework which shares the player's position and heart rate to the observer in a virtual environment. The observers view the game from the player's position but can rotate their head freely to look around. The player's heart rate is measured by a biometric glove. The measured heart rate is shared with the observer using both visual and audio cues. We developed two games based on this framework. The first game provides a calm and pleasing experience where the player catches butterflies while surrounded by nature. The second game presents a scary and stressful situation where the player tries to survive zombie attacks. We conducted a study to learn the effects of displaying the player's heart rate to the observer. From the insights gathered in this study, we present a set of guidelines for designing collaborative VR experiences.
So in the study we did, we looked at how, you know, if we could share the heart rate, how that would um, change people's experience. And what we found is that changed the positive effects. You can see the graph here, for example, um, on the, uh, the blue um, bars are um, sharing heart rate with between two players and the green is not sharing the heart rate. And we saw a, a significant difference in the positive effect, which is correlates to excitement and, and, um, and, and sharing um, heart rate people and in the follow-on experiment i don't have the slides for that we looked at how you could represent heart rate with somebody else and it turns out that people don't really want to see a beating heart on the um on the vr experience what works really well is to hear the sound of the heart rate beating and also to pulse the controller and provide some haptic feedback and combine those two together it um, makes the other person feel more excited when they're in that same um, experience so of course in the vr space we see a lot of trends happening, um, you know, there's much better displays happening. There's, as I've shown you already, technology for real-time space capture and um, stitching um, 3D environments together. There's a lot of support for natural gesture and tracking and traction and now eye tracking. And um, we're, I'm particularly interested in what's happening with putting um, physiological sensors into headsets and EEG um, sensing into headsets. So at the bottom here, you can see a VR headset that have e it has EEG sensors put into it. And that's becoming now a commercial product. So here's a product from a company called Lucid. And for um, $300 US, you can buy a face pad that will fit into your HTC Vive. And it will measure the brain activity um, across the forehead um, and, and let you live stream that into your, um, your VR experiences. And um, there's a company called Nextmind that has done the same thing, but they've built a, 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 a attachment that fits on the back of the VR display that measures the brain activity on the back of your head. And then just a couple of weeks ago, Hewlett Packard announced the Hewlett Packard Reverb G2 Omnicept, which will come on sale early next year. And this is a VR headset that has eye tracking, it measures pupillometry, so how, you know, how wide your di pupils dilate. It also measures heart rate and it has a face camera so it can measure your face expressions all inside of VR. So when you start using technology like this, of course you can capture a lot richer emotional cues and um, provide uh, a richer set of communication cues to another person. But what we're really interested in doing is looking um, beyond that and looking at how we can measure people's um, brain activities inside VR. So we built a system like this. So we have a person in, in VR wearing an EEG um, brain um, cap. And in this case, they also have EMG um, sensors on the face pad, and we also measure heart rate and um, the PPG, so the heart rate variability and the GSR. And so we can use this type of system to measure people's brain activity inside VR with a lot of other physiological cues. And one of the things that we're really interested in doing is looking at brain synchronization. So um, you can see a picture of two people here wearing um, EEG um, headsets, and they're both pointing their fingers at each other. Now it turns out um, about 10 years ago, some psychologists just discovered that if you do physical tasks and you measure your brain activity at the same time, sometimes the phase of the brain activity becomes synchronized. And when that happens, people feel more connected to each other and they feel like, and they perform better on some tasks. So this brain synchronization has been studied for about um, uh, 10 um, years. And you can see, um, um, this is what happens when you do the uh, brain synchronization task. Um, here's two heads. The black dots are where you have um, the EEG electrodes. And this is before they start doing the finger pointing. So um, there's not much happening. And then you get them, uh, each person to point their fingers at each other and then to move their hands around and try and track the other person's finger. And then when they stop finger pointing at the end and again hold their fingers still, you start seeing uh, this activity here. So where those arcs are, each of those connected arcs shows a um, portion of the uh, electrode um, activity that is in sync with the other person. So we've got quite a lot of brain synchronization happening there. So that's been studying for a long time in well, 10 years or so in face-to-face -face situations. But until now, nobody's ever done this in VR. So about six months ago, we did the same experiment in virtual reality. So you can see here two people sitting in VR and um, now they've got the EEG caps plus the uh, VR headset. And then inside the VR environment, they see these avatars and they can now, again, inside VR, 
point the fingers at each other and try and do this finger tracking like you see here. But one of the really exciting things of VR is of course that because you're in VR, you can put yourself inside the other person's body. So you can have an experience like this. So when you look down, you see now out, coming out of your body is an extra pair of arms and you can do that same arm tracking experience out of, out of your body. And our hypothesis is that when you are, in, when both people are seeing the same um, view of the world, then that may in fact increase the brain synchronization. So we started doing some studies on that. Um, this um, shows the brain activity of two people before they start doing the brain synchronization task. So we have some lines connecting there. Those lines um, show some low level activity in common between the brains, but um, you would expect that because um, when you try and measure the brain synchronization, you take each electrode and you compare the um, behavior or the signal of that electrode with every other electrode on the other person's side. So just by chance, you'll get some electrodes that are in sync. But then once we go into the VR and we share the same first person perspective and do that same finger tracking exercise, you see this. And so now what you see now is we have some very heavy red dark lines showing that you've got multiple connections, like four or six connections between several electrodes. So we get much more brain synchronization. So this is just very early results, but we're very excited about how we can use um, EEG and VR and also an AR to measure brain synchronization. And we are also excited about how we could use VR experiences or AR experiences to try to help drive the synchronization. So as an example of that, this is an experience we developed called the um, hyperdrum. So in this case, uh, what you see is, um, let me just turn the, oh, sorry, let me just turn the audio off. What you see are two people drumming inside VR. So you put the VR headset on, you get some big jump drumsticks and you can hit these real objects. And um, as you do that, we measure the uh, brain activity. And um, because it's a drumming task, then, you know, because drumming is really rhythmic, then you, um, the, oftentimes your brain will start synchronizing. And when we uh, do that, when, when your the brain signals start becoming in sync, then we provide more visual feedback um, designed to help keep you in sync for longer. So here's some electrodes that are across the, um, across the front of the head mount display. And then as, as um, I said, as you start drumming, initially you'll see the person sitting across um, from you on the table with a kind of mixed reality interface. You can see them there. Um, and um, when we um, start, when the brain synchronization starts happening, we gradually fade out the person so you can see the person in the real world and we replace them with more um, exciting computer graphics like particle effects and fireworks. And that's designed to help um, encourage that brain synchronization. So this just shows one application how this could be used. We showed this at SIGGRAPH Asia uh, last year and, and we did a survey of people who played uh, the experience and the people who uh, brains were reporting more synchronization um, uh, reported that they had a better experience and they felt they better connected with the other person. So um, what we're seeing with all these technology trends is, you know, as I said before, we've got advanced displays, um, gesture interaction, emotion sensing and sharing. This all kind of trends together towards what you might call empathic tele existence. And the idea of empathic tele existence is that remote people um, move from being observers to participants and they um, move to more experiential collaboration where they feel like they're doing things together and sharing um, implicit communication cues. So there was a kind of a really bad movie that was about, uh, came out about 10 years ago with a Bruce Willis movie called Surrogates. And the premise of this movie was that sometime in the future, there will be all these robots um, in the earth and everybody has their own robot and you can drive the robot using virtual reality. So you go into your VR system and um, you can then virtually inhabit your real robot's body and you can do things in the real world you'd never do because you're a robot. You, know, you can jump out of a building or you can walk underwater or all these amazing things. So I'll play through the, um, I'll play through the, um, the trailer of the movie. Robotic human surrogates combine the durability of machine with the grace of so the Here's all the surrogates. All the robots, of course, are very beautiful. So, you know, 
Our world has become a safer place. And there you are. And there's Bruce Willis. He's going to the VR system. And, just and so, in the real world, he doesn't have him here, but when he's in surrogate robot, the robot has hair, so there is a the robot. The real world. And now he can go out and do things in the real world. You can finally live the and life. So, here's a guy at nightclub jumping off the building. Surviving, but it turns out, um, uh, for the first time, uh, somebody commits a murder, and um, the robot is killed. But also, for some reason, the person in the VR also dies as well. This one of the movie is a, is a Bruce Willis who's a detective has to figure out um, why the um, real robot's being killed also uh, causes um, the real person to die um, as as well. So it's, it's a really not very good movie, but the premise is kind of interesting that, you know, we might be able to have robots um, sometime in the future that we can inhabit and we can experience the world through their eyes. And actually, it turns out this may not be that far in the future. So there's some research being done in Japan um, that allows you to um, inhabit a, vert, a, a robot body um, using a VR. And, um, and there's a company now formed called Tally Existence that lets you do it uh, for real. So this is the video of the Teleexistent company. So you can see the guy there goes into his house and he's got his VR system. He puts the VR system on, he's got these special gloves that provide haptic feedback. And he can select the location, he's going to a surf shop in Hawaii. He's trying to buy a surfboard. So he puts the head on and now this is a robot. And so now the robot is in the surf shop in Hawaii and it can go to the shop and you can look at all the different surfboards and pick out the one he wants and, and talk to the guy in the shop and because he's got uh, tactile uh, have the feedback from his gloves he can feel the surfboard and he can even um, take a selfie photo with the surfboard and then his son comes down and his son wants to play with him so they decide they're going to go and get together and now they're going to go and visit uh, Kyoto and see two of and so they're both going to VR and they can um, go together Kyoto and um, then they decide that they want to go somewhere further and they decide that they're going to go to um, outer space and they go into a robot which is on the International Space Station and now they can get the feeling that they're in outer space. So this might seem like science fiction but this is actually a product you can buy um, today. So um, robots are very expensive, they cost about $100,000 um, US. But the business model of the company isn't to sell you the robots. The business model is to sell you time on the robots. So basically you can, their idea is to have robots scattered all over the earth and you can pay maybe $10 a minute or something and you can jump into a robot view and have a tele um, presence experience. So maybe the, the vision of surrogates may come around before we uh, know it. So just to wrap up, um, today I've talked about how, you know, current conferencing systems have limitations. We're all getting very tired of being on Zoom and AR and VR enable us to go beyond there. You know, as I've shown you some examples, how you can change your perspective, you can share space and experience, you can support nonverbal communication. And there are many, many directions for future research. In particular, in my research lab, we're doing a lot of work on empathic computing and looking at how we can you know, use EEG to do brain synchronization, um, measure emotion, share emotion in VR and many other topics. So that's pretty much everything I want to talk about today. Um, here's my contact details. And if any of you are interested, I can also share a copy of all the slides I shared with you. And I know that Joachim's also been um, recording this um, as well. And so I'm happy now to answer any questions you've got. And I know I've talked, to, well, I've used up most of the time, but I'm happy to stand longer and ask answer questions as long as you want, or um, of course, um, answer things over email.